go in here. And, and this is an interview with Mrs. Leela Tidd in Tidville on October the 11th, 2000. Okay, could I have your full name, please? Leela May Tidd. And is it your maiden name or your married name? Married name. Gosson was my maiden and, name. And who were your parents? Uh, Iona Bunker was my mother, and Michael Gosson from Plimpton was my father, I guess. Okay. <laughs> and your mother's maiden name was? That's what her name ne her was. Her maiden name? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when were you born? April the 9th, 1919. And where were you born? Tidville. <laughs> okay, so how large was your family? I didn't have a family exactly. Um, my father and mother weren't married. Okay. She was only a girl. and uh, But they, we had, uh, they had three children, but uh, I never knew the father. Okay, so where did you fit in in the three children? The second. The second. So what did your father do for a living? Well, see, I didn't know him at all, but uh, they said he worked on that plant up here, used to be up the road. They dug mud or something other and got stuff out oh, of it, okay. white stuff. So did your mother work outside the home? Yes, just housework. Oh, okay. So what was a typical school day like? Great. I just loved it. So what kind of things would you have done? Well, we had the, all of the grades right in the old schoolhouse right here next door. All of them from primer to grade 10. One teacher. So who was your best friend at school? I'd say Mary Terrio. So what types of things would you do with your friends? Well, we didn't have much room, just a small area from the school, so we'd try to play ball. Yeah, and uh, I guess that was about all that we could play because we only had a little small area for the. So what is your best memory of school? I'd say everything because I just loved it. That's good. So what was your least favorite memory of school? Well, I'd, if I had to go into the things that we took, I'd say history. I didn't care for history. <laughs> but everything else I loved. <laughs> so what subjects were you taught in school? Everything I think pretty well that they do today. Uh, Such as? Reading and writing and arithmetic and chemistry and uh, history and health. It was called different then that day, but it was to do with health. So which subject was your favorite? Arithmetic. And why was that? I loved it, I guess, and, and I mean, it was so easy for me. So which <laughs> subject was your least favorite? History. And why didn't you like that? Well, it's where I was so young, it didn't have any, it didn't seem to be anything to me. Today, if I had to study it today, it would be so different. <laughs> so what kinds of things did you have to memorize in school? Well, we had the Bible in our day when I went to school. And we used to have to say a verse of scripture or something when they called our names early in, you know, in the morning, the first thing. And, um, well, we had to study our lessons, but I didn't have to study. That was the great part of it. I'd look at the book. I didn't have any books, you know. I couldn't afford to buy any or my, somebody, whoever had me. And so we used to have to, people would give them to us. I, we walked, my brother and I, way up to Centerville to the lake, or to the end of Lake Midway there to a house. They built a new one now. And we walked up there, my brother and I, in our bare feet on dirt roads to get some books for to go to school with. So how were you disciplined in school? Well, you were made to obey what the teacher said in our day. And if you didn't, well, you had to pay the consequences. They did give strappings in my day, yeah. I didn't get any. <laughs> so how were you disciplined at home? I can't remember much about it because I never had no home, whatever you'd call a home. I don't know what. I stayed with Grampy and Grammy a little while and, the, and then I went to other places, stayed wherever I could sort of work from a board. And 
So what so. were your daily chores? Well, any, anything that they needed to, to, done, to be done in the, in the homes that I went into, you know. Some, I, you know, I just worked from a board. Uh, the first place that I had to go was to uh, the Royal Tids over to Wheel Cove. The little boy had cut his, had something done to his hand and the doctor had to come to Lancet and she was very nervous. I was about 10 or 11 and uh, so he come, the father come and asked me if I would come to be with the doctor when, when he come because his wife was nervous, couldn't stand it, have it lanced. Okay, after your chores were done, what would you have done with your free time? Most always there was something to do in them days. And I was only uh, nine, nine years old when I started cleaning hake sounds. So that was over in the fish plant to Whale Cove and they took the money from me. My mother had got married again. But, uh, <laughs> What was your favorite holiday when you were a child? Man, never heard tell of a holiday that I know of. <laughs> well, I mean, when school stopped, I used to cry because I didn't want it to stop. See, that was the only thing that I had to meet with people and see, see kids and things like that. And so I don't know anything about a holiday. Not like Christmas or Easter? Or oh, well, but there was Christmas that used to come, but the, Chris, the Christmas that my mother died, I mean, she died in November, and the stepfather was supposed to take care of me, but he, he put me outdoors. He, you know, said I couldn't stay there anymore. And Christmas Day, I never even had a dinner or anywhere to stay or anything. So I didn't have a very good life. So did you have a favorite toy? Toy? Mm -hmm. Never heard tell of a toy. One time, I, when I was still with Grammy, that I was young, probably seven or eight years old, they down to the store next to us. They had a store there, and they had little watches, and they was fifteen cents. And I told Grammy that I'd like to have a watch for Christmas, and she said there was no money for watches. Other people used to send people from the island, even. Well, my school teacher, the first school teacher that I had. Her parents was awful good. They used to send me things, you know, clothes sometimes for to wear and, and uh, oranges and things for Christmas that I never saw before. <laughs> so what pets do you remember having? A cat. And what was his name? Tabby. So what was it like in your house when the, when the catalog would arrive? Did you get the catalog back then? I don't know whether we did. Well, it wouldn't mean anything to us mm. because there was nobody that had any money. So where did you get the things that you needed? Well, like I said, I guess that people gave it to me, anything that I, because when my mother died, he never, he wouldn't give me a thing, not, not a thing, not a piece of clothes or anything. He got married in a, two or three months afterwards again. So what was your religion? Nothing in that day. Well, my grandmother was Baptist, I'm sure, even though I was young, I didn't know. And then when I got old enough to know, some of my friends, the kids, why they used to go to Sunday school here to the old schoolhouse, and I went with them. So did you have a favorite hymn? Uh, How Great Thou Art, I guess. But uh, that wasn't in then day, that day, but I mean since I've been a Christian and been going to church and things for the last 50 years. Could you sing me a verse? No, I can't <laughs> sing anymore. My throat is all balled up. <laughs> I miss that because my daughter and I sang in church duets from the time she was 14 and she's 65 now. So what influence did religion have throughout your life? A big part. Yeah told me how to live, you know what I mean? We didn't have any principles to live by or anything before that. You, did, you didn't know right from wrong to, until you get told. And when you get so you could get told, well, then people would tell you, you know, what what you should be or something. I never got out into anything drinking or, or smoking or nothing like that. Never had one in my life, either one. So how did you keep up with what was going on in the outside world? Well, I was married four days before I was 15. Well, I needed a place to stay, 
and we didn't believe in common law on that day because even though I didn't know my father or anything, when instead of taking him away, if they was going to do it, they should have done it when they had the first one, Johnny. He's dead. And, but they didn't do it. They left him here until he had the three children. And then they took him away and forbid him to ever come on Digby Neck. See, they don't do that today. They live common laws. We got so many here on Digby Neck now that you don't dare to say Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> so what do you remember about your teenage years? Well, I didn't have any in a, in a way because I, until I got married, I didn't have no place to go or nothing to do or anything. So I just had to work all the time to, you know, to keep something to eat. So how often would you have left this village? Never. You didn't even go to town? Oh, no, you couldn't get to town unless you could walk it. Nobody had any cars. So if you had got the chance to leave, where would you go? I don't know. That's a $64 question. They were sending me, my grandmother and them was sending me. They didn't want me around too much. I was only eight years old. And so they sent me up on a bus that used to travel here, Guy Moore Houses, to Digby. And I was supposed to go on a train to Annapolis to live with an aunt. And uh, so I got up there. But in the meantime, before I got there, there was a woman on that train, on that uh, train. She was very sweet, and, you know, pretty and nice dress and everything. And she said, where would you be going today? She saw how ragged I was. And, and uh, I said, they're sending me to my aunt. And she said, do you know her? And I said, no. And she said, well, how come you're going there? And I said, I got no other home. And they sent me up, going to send me up there to live with her. And she said, that, is she going to meet you? And I said, well, they tell me she is. She said, if anything should happen that she isn't there, would you go with me? <laughs> and I've often wondered what that would be, what that would have been if, if it had changed, you know, if she wasn't there. Yeah, but, okay, so what were the roads like? Terrible. Had to take oxen and things for to haul the, the bus out that brought the mail down up in, in Lakeside. It was just horrible there. Yeah. Dirt roads. So who would maintain them? Who would look after the roads? I don't know too much about that. Like I said, I was less than 15 when I was married. So I, I mean, they, they worked on them, you know, and, and in the wintertime they used to work on them, shovel them and everything. They'd call all the men out in the morning to shovel the roads. The snow would be so deep. So who were your screen idols, your movie idols? Never ever saw a movie or anything. No. Nope. So what was your favorite outfit to wear? Did you have a favorite? I didn't have no choice. Had to wear whatever they gave me. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of music did you like? Good music. Never ever went for that wild stuff. But uh, I liked Tank Snow, and I liked uh, the other one that died here not long ago. But Wilf Carter. Wilf Carter. Okay. What kind of sports did you enjoy? Well, I never had any sports or anything because only what we played ball there around the schoolhouse. So what do you remember about dating? Don't remember anything. <laughs> I was so young, I suppose. Well, see, the man that I married, he lived over there in the field. Well, they've turned that, tore that all down now. And uh, I was with Mama and lived right over next to the schoolhouse. Now, I was there then because she wasn't very well. And so he knew Mum and everything. And he used to come out here a lot, you know, when Mum was married. And, and uh, well, I don't think there was much dating to I mean, I always liked him because he was good to me and everything. And Mama thought the world of him. See, she'd been born and brought up right with him here. He was a lot older than I was, uh, 13 years old, older. So how far did you go in school? As far as I could go. <laughs> had to take two years in grade 10 because they couldn't let me out. I was too young. So, so why had nowhere else to go, only to Digby or somewhere else and see there was no way I could get there. So how old were you when you left school? Well, I had to stay there till I was 14 because it was against the law to, you know, you had to go till you was 14. So once you left school, what did you do? 
well, I was married then. You know, I got married just after I left school. Yep. So how did you meet your husband? Right every day. Because <laughs> he, he lived right here in the same community. Okay, and what attracted you to him? I imagine uh, security or something like that, you know, uh, know that somebody would take care of you because I hadn't had any stable place before that. So what do you remember about your wedding? Just that I was married over in his home after church one Tuesday night and with his brother and his wife to stand up for witnesses. That's all. <laughs> Where did you go for your honeymoon? Nowhere, just stayed home. <laughs> so how much did you know about the birds and the bees when you got married? Not too much. When I, I was married 18 months before I had a baby, but I didn't have a clue where the baby was coming from or anything. So how did you learn about that kind of stuff? Had to learn the hard way. 26 hours in labor with the first one. <laughs> that was kind of hard. <laughs> no, nobody ever told me. I didn't even know when I first menstruated. I didn't know. I thought I was dying. <laughs> So what happened when a girl got pregnant before she was married? Well, it was a terrible thing. Such as? Well, I mean, they was looked down on and everything, you know. So how would people have treated the father, you know, of a child who was unwed, from an unwed family? Well, we didn't have too many here, this small area, you know. Usually they got married after, either after or just before or something, because there wasn't very many that ever had, you know, to bring up a baby alone in them days. So once you were married, where did you live? With his parents, but he never ever took me there to stay once before we was married because we, we both knew it wasn't right, even though my mother had went through that. So how much did it cost for your first home? I never had a first home. We lived in a little uh, shop that Grampy did had made, built for to do things there. He used to do tires or wheels for cart carts and things like that. And so that burnt down. So when would people get together for a good time? Well, after we were saved, my husband and I, we used to get together a lot then, playing the piano and singing and, you know, like that. That's the thing that we would do. All of the ones that got saved in the church, the Pentecostal church. I am Pentecostal ever since I've been saved. So what was a typical day like for you as a housewife? I'm just about the same as it is today. <laughs> and what kinds of things would you have done? Well, you get up and do your, wash your dishes and sweep your floors and get the old uh, washboard out and wash <laughs> tub and things and try to wash a few clothes and and never ever had a fridge or anything like that until my children was all grown up. So what did you grow and raise yourself? Vegetables and that livestock, that kind of stuff. My husband had a horse that he used to carry the haul of wood out with because all we had was a wood stove in the old house. and. Uh, we used to plant, you know, the regulars, potatoes and turnips or something like that. The kids would help me when they got old enough because my husband had to work. Ten cents an hour. So how much of what you needed would you have made yourself? I used to sew from, from the time I was a little girl, they tell me. I don't know, but I I know after I was married, I did. So it made everything that we had to wear, the kids and me, and yeah, and uh, so for other people, you know, people that was just as hard up as we were, they'd get boxes from the states from some of their people there, and I'd make over clothes for them. So would you have bartered for anything, like trade it, like maybe your potatoes for somebody else's? No, we gave them away if, if we had any extras. <laughs> So how did electricity tra change things for you? Well, a lot because we didn't have electricity till, man, I don't remember how many years it. We went all through the kids' childhood and everything with no electricity or nothing till we could afford to get 
an old house wired. So when did you get running water? I think it must have been after we moved out here about 40 years ago. What was bath night like? Well, had a wash tub, take turns of getting them bath the kids and and then all we'd have would be just wash yourself. <laughs> so how often would bath night occur? Well, we did the kids every weekend. So how did you take care of your teeth? I don't really remember that. Because uh, I don't remember ever brushing my teeth when I was young, ever. So how often would you have seen a dentist? After I was married, I think it was when I was going to have the first Elsie, my first daughter, and my her, it hurt so bad, and they got me to the doctor. My husband did somehow, I don't know how, but and they hauled it out, and it was ulcerated. Oh, it was some pain for so de so many days. So, who delivered the babies in your community? The women, the granny woman, all but one, and one was uh, delivered in the hospital. The last one. I had in the hospital. So she delivered all the babies in the area? Well, she delivered mine, and she delivered them all up and down Digby Neck and everywhere. Yeah, dear old soul. Then I delivered a couple after I got, you know, old enough or with old Dr. Rice. That was the old doctor on Sandy Co in Sandy Cove, yeah. So what personal memories do you have of childbirth? That first one was enough to have. <laughs> How far away was the doctor? Uh, Sandy Cove, what would that be from here, 10, 12 miles or something, another? But we couldn't find him that day that I was in labor so long. He was out looking for a woman. That's what they told us. <laughs> so when would you call the doctor? Well, uh, my water broke on a Wednesday night, and they went and got the old granny woman. So the baby wasn't born until Friday night. And she called the doctor. See, she knew when he should be called, but they couldn't find him. And so I had to stay in labor so long with the baby there, ready to come, but it couldn't come. So do you, do you remember the granny woman's name? <laughs> yes, Filene Frost. So what were some home remedies that would have been common when you were growing up? Well, uh, usually anything that you had in the house, you could use it for something. I know when the children used to have croup or, you know, filled up so, we used to heat up kerosene and a little bit of lard in it so it wouldn't melt. Put that on them. And put that on where? On their chest. Yeah. For, uh, that's for when they had colds, you know, and everything. So what, would, what if they had cut themselves? How would you have, what would you have done? I don't remember them ever getting bad like that until, you know, quite a while after we were saved. Well, I don't know what you believe, and it doesn't matter, but I know what I believe. Right. We believed in having the pastors or somebody pray for us. And I know when Eddie, my boy that's dead now, he got cut, and uh, Lloyd Terrier was alive then, and uh, we got Lloyd to pray for him, and he was right up around good as gold in no time. When, some, when someone died, how was the funeral handled? Usually in the home. The body was laid mm -hmm, in the home? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And? People came to it, yeah. And Con Gidney from Mink Cove used to be the undertaker. Okay. So what happened to the body after? I don't know where they took it. <laughs> so do you, do you remember how many days the body would have stayed in the home? Yeah, about three. Because mm -hmm. okay. I never looked at Mama till the second day because I had never seen a corpse. So what would happen in the winter if the ground was frozen to, to bury the body? Yeah, the men dug, it, dug the graves. Okay, so what year did you start your first job? Well, I never had no real job that carried on or anything because I had four kids. In, in his mother, or his stepmother, so I had quite a family to look after at home. But I used to work in between times, and uh, I was married then and had the children, had some of the, ch yeah, I had all of the whole four children when we used to pack tuna over to Whale Cove.
or Joe Tidd it was then. Old Joe. So you, you mentioned ones that you were eight or nine? Were you nine when I, clean, when I, yeah. See, I was still a school kid then, but that was in the vacation and things like that. So could you explain to me like what you had to do in the fish plant at nine years old? Yeah, it cleaned hake sounds. Did you ever see a hake sound? No. Well, it's something inside of a hake, you know, shaped like that kind of, and it's full of something uh, that has to be discarded. So I'd have to go in through that like that and haul that out and let that stuff out, and then you save the sound, the other thing. That went in the junk. And then we dried them, had to dry them, put them on racks and dry them. So um, would you have gotten paid for that job? Yeah, 15 cents an hour. Okay. So did you have to pay any tax out of it? No taxes then. <laughs> Only tax on your home if you had one. <laughs> so how did your work change with the seasons when you were, I'm talking about when you were still in the fish plant? Oh yeah, well they, they only got the, sort of the same as it is today, kind of. My husband worked in a fish plant for years, but in the winter time, you had an awful lot of time off because see the boats couldn't get out. They only had little boats and little dories and things to fish in. So how dangerous was your work as a child? Well, not too dangerous with the fish, with the hake sounds because they were soft and you know, nothing sharp. You didn't have to use no knife or anything with them. Okay, so what role did the company store play in your life or was there a country store? Yes, there was a country store right up over top of the fish plant same man run it and uh, he used to send me up a lot of times to wait on people that wanted something and I was only a kid. So did most people who worked at the fish plant, did they shop at the country store? No, not too many there because he didn't have too much, you know, just the main thing, same as bread and crackers or something like that. Okay, what do you remember about wartime? I can't remember anything, well I wasn't born the first war first the World War One, but I can remember some about World War Two, because that's only Elsie now, that's only Elsie. Oh, no, I didn't realize you had so much <laughs> This is all set up and there's things are going here. Yeah, all right. Oh. <laughs> Come in. We're recording oh. some of your mom's stories here. Oh, one second. Okay, Mom, I'll go, I just brought you back. I'll go back home. <laughs> yeah, but you coming over before you go to dig beer? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's my oldest daughter. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so what did you remember, sorry, about the Second World War? Well, I can remember airplanes going over. We lived in a shack. Well, we lived in a fish house down on French Beach for a while. That's where my second child was born, in a fish house. And, uh, but then I had the third one, the boy that died with cancer. And uh, I, the airplanes and things, I used to have to tie him out because we lived that far from the road then when he was little. And I used to have to tie him out and I can remember the airplanes going over and him screeching. I'd have to go get him, he'd be so scared of the airplanes. Yeah. So what effect would that have had on your family, the war? Well, I don't know. I, we couldn't buy the things that you was allowed, you know, because we couldn't afford them things. But Arthur Harris, a man there that had a little more, a lot more than we had, he used to come and trade it off, something that we really needed, you know, and we couldn't afford to buy. But he'd take that and give us something that we could afford to have off of, what was, what was they called? Uh, With the stamps? Yeah, something sort of like a stamp it would be. But. So can you give me an example of something that you would have traded or with him, you know what I mean? Oh, yes, yeah. We would trade butter, because we couldn't afford butter, and uh, things like that, you know. And so we'd, what would you have given him in place of the butter, you know? I'd take from him, you mean. Yeah, you take yeah. the butter. Yeah, I'd give him the butter, you know, oh, I'd I let see. him okay. have the butter. And then I'd take, if you had margarine, I'd take that, because that would be so much less in price. And uh, sugar, didn't use a lot of sugar, and they did, so I'd let them have sugar and I'd take something else, maybe a pound of beans or something that you could cook up quick. And so what effect did the war have on your community? Well, you know, when you live way here, away from everything, and no radios, no televisions, and no nothing, you didn't really know too much what was going on, only what you could see. Right. So do you, what do you remember about the Depression? 
Oh, I remember that all right. We was married in it in the 30s, the early 30s, yeah. Can you tell me a story about the Depression? Well, I mean, there was a lot of times that we didn't have anything. I mean, people that had cattle or, you know, farms or something like that, they could get by, but we didn't have any farm or anything like that. And I, I only remember of putting the oldest child to bed once without anything to eat. But uh, we usually had at least some bread or something like that. And then we lived on, like I said, we lived in East Ferry down on the down by the shore, and uh, we could get fish any time we wanted it. I wish I could now. <laughs> and they, they would give us fish, you know, and things like that. And my husband would go fishing in a dory with his brother. And they'd get a few fish, and they had to, it, that was in a dory, and then they'd have to row them over to Tiverton and sell them for 50 cents a, a hundred and take food out of the store. You couldn't get no money. A hundred, a hundred fish, a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. So how did you plan for hard times or for retirement? I didn't plan because we was lucky to keep it going as we was. We never had anything until after we got married and uh, come up here and, and these wages went up from 10 cents an hour to 25 in a fish plant down in East Ferry. And so then we started to get a little bit more to eat and one thing or another. And then his father had a sort of a part farm, had sheep, things like that. So how did your parents pass on their possessions? I wouldn't know. I told you what my mother passed on, nothing, because he wouldn't let her. I mean, he wouldn't give me a thing that she had. And she didn't have many more, much more than we did. And uh, the, the, uh, the old home, that we lived in that come through his his mother or his stepmother and father and so the, they had to get us to come and stay with them because they was old so we stayed there and then they passed that on to us but after they passed it on to us we had to pay the other brothers and sisters their share out of it. Did you have anything at all personal from your mom? Not a thing. Nothing. nothing. No. No. Say, so what would happen if a if a woman was widowed in the community? Well, the other people in the community used to always help them. And that would continue on for quite a while? Oh, yeah. And then after I got married and, and the kids gr grew up, then I had a store in my house. I had that for 31 years and a half and had my kids and the, and the uh, stepmother to take care of them. And she come with me here, out here to this place. Do you remember anything about the poor farm? Yes. I mean, I remember we was there one time to see somebody there that, I mean, he was, uh, you know, he was retarded, sort of, him and his sister, and she couldn't talk or anything either. Just went in to see him. I didn't care too much about it. Do you remember anything about the insides of the poor farm? I can't remember anything about what it looked like, but I can remember that the one that we went to see, he was tied to a, a bed lounger, a cot or something or another. Yeah. What do you remember about elections? Well, I don't know. Well, I, I was able to vote after I got 21 or whatever it was you had to be, but I never knew anything about it before. But I just done what my husband done, because he was older than me, and I presumed that he knew more about it than I did. What is the worst weather you can remember? I don't know. I mean, we saw a lot of terrible storms when we was young. You know, we had thunder and lightning storms pretty near every night when we was kids. Awful storms. But that groundhog storm, I presume, would have been probably the worst that, that I saw that I could remember. What ghost stories do you remember from your younger years? It wasn't the, it wasn't the stories that I had to remember. It was the actions. <laughs> I was scared to death all my life, I think, of everything. Still am, scared of thunder and lightning and everything. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they would do things to scare me, you know, and that's awful. I never would allow anybody to scare my kids because I think it's terrible. It grows up with you and you're, you're afraid. But just for an example, we had it the, where my mother lived. It was in another part of the house, uh, her husband's 
father and mother lived there, and she had they had the other part just, and uh, they they uh, they all slept upstairs in an open chamber, and uh, they'd tell tell ghost stories and things, and then one of the men there he was I don't know half retired it maybe, but when I'd start to go to bed, sometimes he'd be lay, stretched out onto the one of the stair steps going up with something over him, and that would scare me to death. And then I remember one night that he got under my bed, and after I got in bed, my bed started to raise up, you know, like that. Do you have any superstitions, or did you have any superstitions? No, I've never been superstitious. No. Mom was, Grammy was, all of them were, but I never was. No. Nope. So how did people know when to plant and when to harvest their crops? Oh, I suppose that their own common sense knew that if you didn't plant something in the spring, you wouldn't get nothing in the fall. <laughs> so can you tell me about any shipwrecks in your in this area? No, they was they was the uh, what was her name? <laughs> I can't never think of them. He come they come ashore. The man, one of the men, come the captain come ashore over to Wheel Cove, and some of the kids was old enough then for to go over and see it. Yeah, but what was that called? <laughs> I'm forgetful. What local stories can you remember? No, not not too many. Some, you know what I mean, from same some of the areas around us, but not knowing them personally. So, there was uh, uh, two or three that was drowned in the August gale way back, quite a few years back, and I knew that one of them, but not personally. But she had been engaged to him, This, the one that married my husband's brother. And so when he got killed, why well, she married my husband's brother afterwards, I mean, she fell in with him. Yeah. So how did your community police itself? Well, it's, it's great to say, I wish I could say it now, you really didn't need any. <laughs> oh, that's good. I guess it is. I wish it was that way today. So where did the better off people live, people with money? Where well, in, it mixed in, mixed multitude. <laughs> so did you belong to any organizations, you know, like the, um, like the Knights of Columbus? Or no, the just the church just when we got saved, yeah. Okay. So what do you remember about tourists? coming to the area? Not too much. There wasn't too many tourists that ever came this way. After I had the store, they used to come once in a while, and uh, they would stop in, you know, not knowing. I remember one day they stopped in, two or three ladies, and uh, I was making uh, pickles and jam. I had two things to go, and all I always had to, on account of the store, I had to just get them in somehow. And they said, what is that that we smell so good, you know? So they ended up out in the kitchen trying the stuff that I was a cook. <laughs> so that was good. Oh yeah, it was nice, yeah. So what were some of the colorful characters in your community? What would that be, the ones that was half cracked or something? <laughs> <laughs> Hope you don't yeah. play that in front of anybody. <laughs> Did you have any colorful people in your, in your community? No, see the two that was taken to the poorhouse there, they, you know, they weren't right. So do you remember when they were taken away? Oh, yeah. And for what reason? No reason, just the father wanted them away. He didn't want to feed them. So who took them there? Some, something, but the same, something to do with the, well, like today, you know, families and things that they have to, because they, they come and took me. I remember the name of the man that come and took me from my aunts up there because she was a bootlegger, and they and I hadn't been to school for a year, so they found it, found out somebody must have reported it up there. So he come and took me away and brought me here to back to Tidville again, where I had lived. And they went to Mama and asked her if she she could take me while she was living in that other man's house, you know, with her husband. And uh, he happened to be in there in that part that day. And he said, "No more kids coming here." So Prosser, Mr. Prosser, see, I can remember him. He said, uh, well, we can't put a child where she isn't wanted. And my grandfather, that was my mother's father, 
he happened to be in there that day too. And he said, well, the other two boys is with me. So he said, uh, she can come there too for a while because he said, I don't want them to grow up and not know one another. So he kept me for a, a while. He hit you. He kept me. Oh, he kept you, sorry. Mm -hmm. So what do you remember about Maud Lewis? Nothing, only what I'd hear, same as you or anybody, what we would hear on the news and things. Yeah, I went by the house so many times, you know, and seen the things that she always had out, all the pictures and things that she painted. So how does this place, this area, look compared to when you were growing up? Well, much different today than it was then. I mean, there is some good homes in Tidville now in East Ferry, you know, around to what there was then. So there wasn't too much, there wasn't too many rich people in our area. <laughs> so how have people's attitudes changed toward the environment? Well, they seem to be talking a lot about it today. They never mentioned anything about it in that day. Right. So how would you compare family values today with those of days gone by? Well, they're much better today, better off in a way, but I don't know. I, I've said so many times I'd like to go back to the old days because we never had to be afraid of you know, people gunning you down or killing you or doing something drastic. Everybody could live, never had a door locked, never had a door locked, only had a door. I've only had our doors here locked for about 20 years maybe or so. Yeah, leave them wide open. We didn't ever find out Mrs. Tidd's husband's name. Millage. His full name. That's what Millage did. He'd had no middle name. Okay. And just tell Susan a little bit, Mrs. Tidd, you mentioned at the start of your conversation about somebody mining some kind of Yeah. Oh. Just explain that a bit to Susan. We're yeah, I don't know. See, I don't know what it was called. Right. It was up here. Well, between here and that old house that's up there, it was between there on that right side. And there's sort of like a big lake it was uh, there. And they used to dig, dig stuff. And they used to work nights and everything. That stuff that Derek Dimitation? Had. Yeah, some, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they used to work nights and everything there. And Dad worked there, my husband worked there, and my brother worked there, 10 cents an hour. Do, do you know what kinds of things they would have done there? What, yeah, they dug it out of the earth, you know, and dried it. And then big trucks used to come and get big bags of it and everything. And what did they say they made with it? Perfume or something? Well, different things. See, I can't remember that, what they made with it, but I've seen it when it was working, you know. I've seen it at night when it was all lit up in there, you know, and everything was a-going. <laughs> so how many people would that have employed? I wouldn't know that. I suppose maybe 10 or 12, maybe, or something. Not a big crowd, you know. About what year would that have been? Men, I don't know that either. The 30s, <laughs> do you think? Or? Oh, no, I think it was a little further ahead than that, because I was married. And we could have been in the late 30s, because I was married in the 30s. Yeah. Your memory fails. A good thing I remember things that happened way back. I think you've got a wonderful memory. <laughs> My goodness. But it's hard to remember names. Yes. Yeah. See, I'm, I was 81 my birthday. And Were you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and what are your children's names? Elsie. Bessie, Eddie, and Grace. And do the three girls all live around here now? No. no. Grace lives in New Brunswick, but she they go down south every November or something. She said she's going to stay home for Christmas this year or else. Yeah, because she'd like to be home where the family is. And then Eddie, my son, he died with cancer of the brain. That was terrible. So how old would he have been? Forty. Had three boys. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. And then Scott, that's my other boy, he, we adopted him when he was five months old. Yeah. He was they, him and his wife was down for the vacation for Thanksgiving.
the store she ran. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the store that you ran. Oh, yeah, and I loved it. That was a job I had that I loved, 31 and a half years of it, all alone. <laughs> so what kinds of things would you have sold in the store? Everything that you could want except cigarettes or tobacco of any kind. I never had sold a thing of that line in the store. So along with uh, goods, would you have carried clothes or anything Well, like babies, you know, little ones. Right. Yeah, things like that for babies, but not adults' clothes. Yeah, all kinds of groceries and vegetables and everything like that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was the whole thing. The back part there, they built it on there, and it was the whole length there. I forget how many feet it was. It was a lot, because uh, my boy, the one that died, him and uh, Gus Thibodeau took one part of it there and built that big room there, living room there, and uh, and then the, after, oh, I don't know, 25 years maybe, they, they built that, took that off of that and uh, we still had all the rest of it there and they built another piece on for to keep the stock when it came in. Right. Yeah. So did you run the, the store yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Did and what was the store of name? Kids Grocery. One more thing I'd be interested in hearing about is you, you mentioned a few times about you and your husband when you got saved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, see, I didn't know anything about anything like that, but there was people around here that had been saved in the Baptist church, you know, and I mean, their life was changed and everything. And uh, I didn't have much to change as far as that goes because I never swore or I never drank and I never smoked, but I mean, you're still unsaved until you get saved. <laughs> and so uh, one of the old deacons that lived here he, they was having special meetings down in East Ferry in the old hall. And he come over different times and he said, Leela, you should go down to church down there in the old hall. He said, they're having special meetings there. People's getting saved. And he said, it would be good for you. And I, I laughed at him. I said, I don't think I'll bother somehow like that. But I was all alone and they, they was a Lloyd Terrier, like the one I told you that they prayed for my boy. Well, he was saved and uh, his father, there was only two or three that had got saved. But uh, Lloyd, he began praying for uh, me and Millage because he thought a lot of us. He'd always come to us when we lived down there in the fish houses and things. He used to come and talk, play cards and things. And so he talked to us about it. and It began to bother me. It must have been him praying that bothered me. And I remember one morning I was all alone. Well, Grammy was in her room, but I was alone there. And just something just come over me, and I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I said to myself, and I said, maybe if I prayed, if I knew how to pray, maybe maybe there's something wrong. So I went upstairs, and I knelt down in the second girl's bedroom, Grace, and I began to pray and cry. I didn't know what to pray for, and I didn't know how to pray or anything like that. But the Lord saved me right there, all alone, and I was completely different. I didn't think I could be any different because I didn't think I was really bad. <laughs> but uh, I was completely different. And that night I had to, I wanted to go to church so bad and never went to church. And then old people used to ask me to go to church. I said, no, the walls would fall in if I ever went inside of a church. But that night I got on the bus. There was a bus that traveled back and forth, you know, to Digby and or Guy Morehouse and went down to the ferry to church that night. And I uh, witnessed to, to it. I told them that I'd been saved and everything. And Lloyd Terry and his father, they shook my hand and everything, told me how happy they was about it. So it was only a little while. I went, I went back home and uh, I told Millage, my husband, about it and everything. I never coaxed him to go or anything, but I'd go every Sunday. Had to walk it over them bad roads and everything, mud and muck and everything. And uh, I guess maybe it was probably six months or more. And uh, one night he used to go out and build a fire in the old schoolhouse for him to have meetings here. And he went out one that night and he took the wood with him. He took the wood out to build the fire, made up his cigarettes before he went out to have to smoke when he come out. And uh, he got saved that night too, went to the altar and gave his heart to the Lord. 
come out through the cigarettes and everything in the stove, never swore again, never smoked another cigarette right from that night, never touched one again. Yeah, Com wonderful man, wonderful man. I had the best husband that there could have been on the face of the earth, yeah. So do you remember how old you were when this happened? Yeah, I was uh, around 30. So your husband would have been? He'd have been 42 or 43, yeah. And he'd smoked from the time he was a kid. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And so we, we lived that way all the time. We brought up our kids that way. We had family altar in the home at night with the kids around. We read the Bible and prayed with them. And they never got into any trouble or never been to a, <laughs> never had a police after them or anything, never even violated the laws. None of them ever lost a license. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was wonderful, most wonderful thing that ever happened. And then they told us, you know, different things that the Bible says, because we didn't know. We'd never studied the Bible or nothing like that. And uh, they spoke about tithing, you know, giving 10% to the Lord of what you make. So I remember the first tithe I had was 10 cents. I got a dollar from some, for doing something. And the minister's wife, him and his wife, they went, every church that they ever went to, they told about that woman that the first tithe she paid was 10 cents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the Lord seemed to prosper us from then. It seems everything that we would do, that uh, the Lord would prosper it, and we'd get back a lot more than we ever gave. Yeah, so that's that's how much it pays to give to the Lord. So is that a practice that you've carried on? Oh, through yes, years? all through my life, yeah, always. Have done it all through my life. Yeah. Even on the old age pension, I still pay my tithes to the church. And I worked for the Lord for all the years. I've, I taught Sunday school for over 40 years, adult class. And I preached so many times for the minister, filled in for him when he'd go somewhere. And worked for the Lord all the time, done whatever I could. <laughs> yeah. I was always happy when I was working for the Lord. My kids even tell me that. They said, Mom, you always was the happiest when you was on the platform doing something teaching a class or leading a song service or having a preaching for some for a minister. They used to go around go away a lot in them days of ministers, conferences and everything. And I'd have to fill in for them till they come back. <laughs> yeah. You must be worn out, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked all of them years and yeah. you know, not only that, but I had the store to tend and everything too. And uh, and we used to work, you know, clean the church and everything like that. And Mary and I, the one I said was my friend all years, her and I used to paper. Uh, they had a, a parsonage right on it then, right on the church. Now we got a nice parsonage all, all by itself. And there's only 10 usually that goes to church now. I mean, the young people all went away and everything. And we support that church, us, us 10 people. We support that church and we don't owe a cent to anybody. Amazing. I guess it is. Everybody says that. Yeah. Yeah. They so talk about it in the other churches. I mean, they've got so many people, and yet they get in debt and everything, but we don't. We've never been in debt for oil or anything in the winter or nothing. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah. Is, your, is your best friend still alive? Oh, yes. Is she? She's, she's 80. Uh, will be. Yeah. My daughter, I used to play the piano in church for all years and years and years. And then. Uh, after a while, we divided it up because I had so many things to do. And I, Mary, I knew Mary could play. So I said, Mary, you should take turns. And so the minister's wife then, she said, well, there, you, you play in the mornings, uh, Sister Ted, that's what they called me, and uh, Mary will play at night. And then we'd change around, and I'd play in the morning, in, or the opposite, anyhow. Yeah, so then Mary got old. She had cancer and a few years ago and she had to quit for a while so my oldest daughter the one that was here a while ago she plays in church now we never took a lesson never studied a lesson never didn't know one note from another both of us but we've played in church for years <laughs> and her and i used to sing too all the time yep it was a wonderful life when you was able to do all those things. I said if I could do all of that now, I'd still be happy as I was then. But it's uh, 
gets kind of gloomy once in a while. But you still know the Lord is with you, and that's the main thing. It's true. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh. Wonderful, wonderful stories and comments. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for. Yeah. <clears throat> Why? Why did that automatic button come on? Yeah, that was there all the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Said, you know, 